Hello and welcome to the sixth fly fishery focus here on Cadence Fly Fishing TV. We're here today at the absolutely stunning Hury Reservoir near Barnard Castle in County Durham. It's a fantastic venue at 125 acres. It's full of rainbow trout and wild browns. Fingers crossed we're going to get a few. If you get the chance we'd really appreciate you subscribing to the channel as there's so much stuff coming up from all aspects of fly fishing including a new section on helping beginners. Right, well that's been a bit of a walk. Uh, we're up here now, it's the top of Newhouse Bay if you look on the map. Obviously we've got a nice big waterfall underneath, uh, upstream of us. This little tiny streamy bit can be uh, really good in warm weather, which it is today. You don't get many casts at them because it's quite shallow and they spook easily, but we've maybe got 10 or 12 casts before we move, but it's definitely worth sticking your head in here. I'm gonna start off with a little dry flyer size 18 shipments. Uh, I'm gonna start further downstream and then I'll work my way up into the, the best spot where that rock is just on the corner. There's a rock sticking out in that little bit there. That's probably the peak bit, but we'll just start by fishing closer in and cover this water before I have to stand up and move. It's really windy, so. This could go wrong quite quick. Normally the response is pretty quick here on the dry. I would have expected one first cast, but... Oh, that was a brownie, that. This is a good spot for getting little wild browns out. So I'll take anyway. Oh, little brownie again. That's so quick. Okay, well after two little missed takes there, I've changed setup a little bit. I've just shortened the leader by three or four foot because the wind was just blowing a it, what was a 12 or 13 foot leader and it was just crumpling in a heap so I wasn't in touch with the fly so I've shortened the leader right down it may seem daft but I think I'm on about seven or eight foot here and that that'll just help the fly turn over quicker because fishing in this little bit here I need I need to be in contact with the fly the second it hits because these things are like lightning, they see the fly, they take it. This will look terrible on the camera, I think, because the lane's splashing down because I'm having to really push it. I think. Uh, The problem is if I go any closer to that bush there, 
I'm asking for trouble. We're getting stuck on water, but I want to go further up into the faster water. Hey, that's the one we wanted. <laughs> Little brownie. So that there, that was the first cast up into that fast water that we haven't touched before. So it lets you see your first and second casts in an area really are key. I can't see that fly at all. It's really banging down. Just by the rock there, I would expect the take, but I think all three of the takes that I've had so far have been within three or four seconds of the fly hitting. Way. That's a rainbow. That was right next to that rock. I thought we'd lost our chance. I've got here the rod set up as a cadence 10 foot 5 weight. It probably wouldn't be ideal for fishing little streams like this. I was going to bring the nine foot four weight, but the wind's just too strong. So I've just brought the five weight for the dry fly fishing. This is going well. What we'll do is we'll go through all the flies later on. So I'm not showing you every fly that is catching, I'll just show you like a little summary near the end. In the hope that we catch more than one anyway. Brilliant. We'll just get him back quickly. Flies out. That's a rainbow about a pound and a half. Get out of there. Perfect. This water here, that's just off to my right, under that bush, it might look good to cover from the angle that you're watching from, but where that rock sticks out, there's just bushes hanging over it. It's just about impossible to get at, but that's kind of what's good about these little streams. Which unbelievably is part of the Huri Reservoir. What this is, is it's a stream that comes through the Selset Tunnel. And Selset is a reservoir on the other side on another valley. It's a wild brown trout reservoir. And alongside Grassholm, Selsa and Grassholm together, they're the ones that feed the River Loon, which goes down into Lancashire. Selsa, I think, I think is about 700 acres, 750 acres. And that was built in the 60s. I think you can, you, well, I know, you can fish Selsa for nine pound a day, but it's wild browns only, but it's, uh, it's phenomenal value fishing. And then just down the valley from Selsa is Grassholm, which is kind of like the main water in this area. Grassholm is 100 and, 
10 acres, I think, I might be wrong, but that is a fly fishery and a bait fishery. So you can fish with uh, worms, power bait, spinners, and fly on grass home. And that's where the main visitor center is for these waters. So you can buy a ticket for Hury at Grassholm, but it's about a 10 minute drive. Over the, just over in the next valley, we've got this reservoir and then there's two reservoirs above and above again. So we're in the bottom on Hury, which is 125 acres. And then in the middle is Blackton which is 66 acres, and then above that is Boulder Head, which is about 300, 300 acres. Blackton and Boulder Head are wild brown trout only, and just like Selsa, you can fish those for nine pound a day or seven pound for concessions. But here is, a, here is like the fly only fishery. I think we've done that spot to death, so the problem with fishing around this bit, I want to fish in here, I know there's fish here. It just it's dragging really quick, so as soon as the fly's dragging, I don't feel that I've got much of a chance. But we'll give it a little try. Maybe get three or four seconds where the fly's fishing okay. dragging really quick. Right, we've tried the dry fly. I had four takes in a little time, but they've dried up quite quickly on that. So just while we're here, I'm just going to put an indicator through here because there's a nice little channel that's half a foot deeper going down the middle there. But most of all, there's a limestone ledge just going underneath us, which there'll be fish lying up against. So we'll just see if we can winkle a couple out on the indicator. Oh. Don't know if it's rocks, I might just be fishing too deep. I think I'm only set at about, oh, that was a fish. I think I'm only set at about two foot. That's a fish, there we go. Oh, he's okay, oh, he's off. That was a bit bigger. In this unusual situation of fishing on a reservoir with a stream, you're probably better off casting upstream to stop the drag. Hello, I've got a lot of slack line there, but it's just it's just buffering it from dragging. I'm just putting in some daft little mends. And that's coming down nice. That's a <laughs> half asleep. Bumped it. There's a lot of these that I'm striking out are probably not fish because they're just going under just gently at the speed of the current so I'm probably just dragging the bottom so I'm just looking out for the takes that are really going under quite drastically or maybe off to the side. <laughs> but I suppose if there's one suggestion you can do here it's if you're uncertain, just strike anyway. I think we're probably just fishing a few inches too deep. See, that's gone under, but yeah. I'm going to shallow this up, not by much, five inches or so.
Right, what we've got going on here is the cardinal scent for dry flies and indicators. The tip of the line is just starting to sink. I should have put some super glue on the tip before I put the braided loop on, but it's an easy fix. It's an old line. But if your fly line's going under the surface when you're fishing with indicator or dry fly, it's burying in and you're gonna miss take after take after take. So grease it up. And if that floats, it stops the line taking on like a bell shape under the surface. That's better. So if you don't grease the line up and the leader and the, the fly line is sinking, it forms like a bell under the surface and that bell is just slack line. So when you strike, all you're doing is pulling into slack line. So you, you don't want that, that bell forming underneath the water. You need to be in as direct a contact as possible. I think I'm maybe just a bit too shallow there. Just try further up a little bit. This is a bit of water that we haven't put the indicator in, so if we're going to get a take, it should be pretty quick. There we go. Whee. Oh, he's off. But let's you see the, the importance of new water that hasn't had a fly through or that, that method through. It's maybe 20 minutes since we put the dry fly over and the reaction was just, it was instant. When you're tying the fly on, make sure you check the hook point. Just give it a rub along the underneath because quite often you'll find that the hook has just got a rough edge right on the point where you've just caught it casting. So just give that a check each time you tie a new fly on because if you're anything like me, you'll be putting in flies with little burrs on that you fully intended to sharpen but you never did. As usual, if you get a take in the area on the indicator or anything, put it straight back in. That fish there took twice in a matter of seconds. Extend the arm just to keep it running down without dragging. As soon as it starts to drag, then you start to pull it across the stream rather than down the stream. Okay. Well, I think we've done this spot to death now, so. It's always worth coming back to, so we'll go further around the bay, onto the other side of this bush and out into where it goes out into the bay proper. And then we'll go and give some of the other spots a try as well. Well, we're still here at the top of Newhouse Bay. We're just about 100 yards down from the stream now. As you can see here, we've got this channel. The stream channel continues. We're in very low water here. There's not much water coming in through the stream compared to normal. But there's quite often a fish or two in this channel. What you've got to be careful of is there's a sunken trunk over there. But fingers crossed, we might be able to get a one fairly soon in here. I'm going to start off with a, a slow intermediate, 0.5 inches a second. And I've got on a little mini peach cat's whisker with a peach light bright body. So what I've found here in the past is it's, it's pretty important to let the fly sink for five or six seconds first. I'm probably expecting more of the fish to be just, just where the channel nips in, just above the, 
the tree trunk, which you can't really see. You can see the roots of it when we get down there. It's important with a, a, an intermediate line like this, it doesn't really want to sink, so just give it a couple of pulls to get in touch and also to just sink it below the surface. I am doing a slow figure of eight. This isn't a retrieve, it's just keeping the line from getting bends in it and letting it sink, so. I'll try a quick retrieve there. I want to put the dry fly on. There's not that much coming up, but just there's two fish come up tight against the far bank. Where that little bubble line is, tight against the far bank, it only comes out two or three foot. But it looks to me like that's where the fish are. It's never a bad bit of advice in river or stream fishing. If you, if you follow where the main bubble line is, you're probably not a million miles off the fish if you don't know a stretch. And I guess that applies to here, even though we're in a reservoir. So maybe if I drop this on the far bank almost. And drop it into the water. It's just on the mud on the far bank now. Leave it in there as long as possible. There's another fish there. It's a bit awkward to put a dry fly in them from here with this wind. There is some flies coming off here now. They're not peach cat's whiskers. Oh, that's a take. That was right on that bubble line. Ooh, that's a good fish. Yeah. It's not massive, but it'll certainly do. It's hard fishing today. Certainly bigger than the average fish, I would have said. Yes. Well, that's a nice fish. It's probably about two and a half to three pound, which is a little bit bigger than the average for here, but it's still a good average size, but that's a nice fish to get on the camera. Uh, hopefully we can get another one, but we'll let this one go. He's full of fight. We'll get him away. Nice fully finned fish. And off he goes. Brilliant. And we've got that fish just where it starts to go into the lay-by, just off the point. So it's probably worth having another go in there because that's where we've also seen some fish rise. So that was bang on the button there. You never know. I'm certainly fishing too shallow, otherwise that indicator would have stood up. But a fish would still have it. It must be a foot and a half. 
over there. I suppose you can see from the slope of the land. It's worth pointing out as well. Uh, obviously, we're not in conventional reservoir area at the minute, which we will be in a bit. But one one of the things, if you're coming to a reservoir and you've never been to it before, I remember reading a thing in uh, an old trout and salmon years ago when I was a kid. It said if you arrive at a reservoir and you don't know where to go, one of the best bits of advice on where to go is look at the steepness of the bank. So if you arrive at the reservoir and you've got a cliff falling straight off, the water's probably too deep for trout to be absolutely ideal. And also, if you go to a bit of water where it's really gently shelving and it just goes out forever and ever and ever, it's probably too shallow. Because if you just look at the continuation of what would happen with the, with the ground under the water, Obviously the best is like the Goldilocks porridge where you just get a gentle shelving, but it is going down. And in that same article, I think it said the ideal depth for trout fishing is about eight foot. And I ain't really found a lot wrong with that. I know by the way this indicator is sitting that the water is quite a bit deeper here. Now we've got past the neck of this channel, so I'm gonna increase the depth. So we're what, there, four foot? So I'm just gonna increase the depth of that by another foot and a half. Because I just get the feeling that the fish are lying on the bottom today. We've got, <coughs> it's obviously not gonna come across watching this, but the conditions today are really muggy. We've got a real change in weather conditions from cool to hot, muggy, really quite a strong wind. Oh, it was a fish. Oh, that worked straight away, dropping it deeper. So we'll put it straight back in. But yeah, just when it's like this, I always think that the fish are a bit more inclined to stick around the bottom and not, not move so much near the surface. I know we got those ones on the dry fly before, but that was a little bit earlier on at about half eight. I think we're about 10, 10 30 now, and it's just any fish that were coming up have stopped. Even though there's a fly or two coming up. There look to be some kind of olives. <laughs> We've just had a nice few fish up in Newhouse Bay. We've just moved further east along the bank here, and this it's a much smaller bay. This one's called Waterfall Bay. It's a little bit confusing because there's a massive waterfall on Newhouse, and I don't think there's a waterfall in, in sight here, but it's maybe up behind the bridge there. But this is a smashing little bay if you just want to go past and maybe catch one or two quick little brown trout. Especially at the end here, you can always catch one or two, but 
it's only going to last two minutes, so we might as well give it a go. Just to recap on the setup that I've got here, this is the Cadence 10 foot 5 weight. It's now in a, in a better environment on a still water as opposed to a bit of running water. I'm just fishing with a size 18 shipments. Just seen a fish right there at the end of the bay, just where that point comes out. Not many chances to cast at rising fish today, so hopefully I've pulled enough line off. That's not quite covered it, but it's nearly always there that the fish will show. Probably better off sitting down. One of the reasons Hury's such a good place in the summer is that it's got two or three areas that are completely different to what like, most reservoirs have. We've got uh, inlets that are quite, quite a reasonable sized inlet and that pumps cool water in. For example, that water at the top of Newhouse Bay, that's been in a tunnel for, I don't know, five to 10 miles underwater. So there's been no sunlight on it. So it's cooler. It's been moving so there's more oxygen. So wherever you get an inlet on a reservoir, you should always concentrate on, on where that water comes in, but also a long way from where that water comes in. It still has an influence even quarter of a mile away in a place like this because those fish are there because they've sensed that cooler water out in the main reservoir so they've gone up there it's a similar setup here it's not quite as major but you can see where the little stream comes in so once again any inlet fish around there unfortunately i think the conditions are completely against us for the dry fly in fact they're massively against us so Let's not worry too much about not catching anything here. It's, <laughs> it's been a massive change in the weather today, so it's not surprising that the fish are behaving a bit weird. One of the best things about fishing a place like Hury is um, the wildlife. The bird life is, a, is just completely different to what you would get on a normal uh, fishery because we're so high up. So just driving up to the fishery this morning, I had to slow the car down on the approach road because there was a curly walking along in front but there's also oyster catchers various different birds of prey i've seen all the gray wagtails and everything but you're not going to be a million miles from grouse and things like that as well it's just a different noise <laughs> right on cue that's an oyster catcher this spot here is just after the entrance to waterfall bay it's a little bit deeper as you can see. The ground here has got a nice medium shelving about it. So this is, this is the kind of water I'd be looking for if I didn't know this reservoir well. It's gonna shelve into some reasonable depth of water. And I've, I have had a few fish here in the past. I'm trying to die three line now with a snake, a white snake. It's not been the hottest of hot spots for me in the past, but it's definitely delivered quite a few fish. That's going out nice. And if you look over my right ear, there's a chap fishing on the point over there. That's uh, Reedy Bay, Reedy Point. It's a much shallower part of the lake. But it's quite, a pop it's quite a popular spot with some people. It's not, it's not one I've done too well on myself in the past, but judging by some of the other guys, they do really quite well there. So that's definitely worth a look. And it's also a really comfortable weight to fish, if wading's your thing. This cast here, I'm doing back to front because the wind's blowing the wrong way. just like a chatting, so you cast back the front and stop the fly blowing into your ear. It's just at a nice angle to do that actually, so. It's going out a long way. This year with a eight weight line, this is a die three airflow and I'm using the nine foot nine eight weight, which as I've said before in the other videos is, the nine foot nine eight weight is the absolutely perfect sinking line rod for 
intermediates, die 3, die 5, die 7. I wouldn't use anything else for that in the range. But so far, I've let this lane go down 10 seconds, 15 seconds. I haven't touched the bottom yet with a die 3, so. Oh, that was a little bump, I think. Lane just lifted on the hang. I'm almost certain that was, but it could have just been a, a little brown nipping. It's certainly a point to concentrate on is when you're lifting off the hang. You can leave the hang as long as you want. One of the things about coming to Hury is how you'll get a day ticket. It's a bit different to most fisheries. Because it's a very remote reservoir, you would have to buy a ticket in one of three different ways. You can't buy it at the reservoir, that's the main key point. So don't arrive here because it's going to end in tears if you do. You can either buy it online or at the Bookwen website. You can ring the Grass Home Visitor Centre on arrival in the hope that there's a signal. Or you can buy the ticket itself at the Grass Home Visitor Centre in the old fashioned way. The issue with the Grass Home Visitor Centre is it's about 10 minutes drive over the hills to get there. So they're there and back, you're probably adding 20 minutes onto your journey. So what I always do is book it at book when the night before. It's also worth pointing out, you've got to pay it and book it before 11.45 the night before you travel. Otherwise the, the machine will cut off and you won't be able to buy it and you'll be left with the other two options. So go onto the Bookwen website, book it that way, Grass Home Visitor Centre, in person, the old fashioned way, or over the phone. Whichever way you've bought your permit, you'll be given a special number. What you need to do when you arrive on site, at the north end of the dam wall, there's a little hut and there's a port loo next to it. Go into that hut and sign that number in with your name and your car registration. You'll also need your car registration when you're booking in online because the wardens will travel around the reservoir and just check everybody's cars here or not here. Regards prices, the value for money is exceptional here. You've got a huge range of tickets, couples permits, singles permits, junior permits, but as a rough guide, it's £28 for eight fish, it's £24 for five fish, or you can have an all-day catch and release ticket for £19. This is correct of July 2023. There's also a ticket available for under 17s, which is a fantastic ticket. It's £10 for two fish, and that's all day fishing. And you can catch and release after that because it's fly fishing, you can release the fish quite easily. Right, now we're going to have a look at the rods that I've used here at Hury today, and also the rods that I would recommend from the Cadence range for you fishing on any of the reservoirs up here. First of all, we've got the Cadence 10 foot 5 weight, which would be my go-to rod for nearly every water there is, but especially somewhere like Hury, Grassholm, Derwent, Kielder, any of those waters. It's an absolutely superb dry fly rod, and it's the one that I wouldn't be without out of all the rods available. Today, I've been using the Shipman's on there. We've managed to winkle a couple of fish out before the sun got too high but it's a really lovely soft action rod. It's slightly old fashioned even, it's, it's a gorgeous thing to use. Just as a, as a little aside, the lines that we have on this rod, because it's a five weight, the running line is a, is a red running background, so you don't have to write on the spools what color it is. Every line has got its own unique color. Moving on, I've also got here uh, the indicator rod, for today anyway. This is the Cadence 10 foot six weight. You could use anything for the indicator, eight foot, seven weight, five weight, whatever, depend on the wind of the day. But today it's the six weight that got that job. I would also use this one for buzzers or for pulling small traditional wets and things. When you're fishing at places like Hury, you've got a lot of land-born insects that are gonna get blown onto the reservoirs. So you've got your heather flies, um, hawthorns and everything like that. And they're getting blown onto the water. So your traditionals like Zulus and Cape McLarens which we're going to cover in a little bit more detail later. 
but they're that that kind of set up the two or three traditional pattern set it up on a 10 foot six weight and it's just about perfect onto the third rod now and this one here is the cadence 10 foot seven weight the other two rods we had loaded with the 5.6 reel, the Stevie Munn 5.6 reel. This one is the 7.8 reel on the 10 foot 7. What I've got on here today, and this is a great line for Huri again, this is the Airflow um, Slow Intermediate, which is a 0.5 inches per second. This is the 7.8, and it's worth pointing out here if you have this line and you wanted to cross over on another rod. I've tried them on all of our range of rods. And the 7.8 airflow line for this one definitely goes best with a 7 weight rod. I've used it on the 8 weight and it's just, it's not quite heavy enough on the 8 weight. It doesn't quite load it up enough. So I would definitely recommend you use the airflow 7.8 on the 7 weight cadence rods. Also, we have the 9 foot 9 8 weight. Today, this has got the die 3 on. I wouldn't really want to go much deeper than this on Huri. I don't think there's too much need for a die five, maybe a little bit near the boils, but overall I, I probably wouldn't come on here with anything much heavier than a die three. This is the Airflow die three, it's the seven eight, and it goes with a nine foot nine absolutely perfectly. If I was to pick two rods from the Cadence Ridge just to bring by themselves, one would be this for heavier intermediate lure work, covering up for indicator work, deeper line work, and then the the 10 foot five weight. The other two rods I, I tend to flip around with, but I would definitely have the nine foot nine eight weight and I'll definitely have the 10 foot five weight. So that's the four rods that we've used today here at Hury. Now just to explain how the cadence setup works. In summary, you can't buy cadence in tackle shops. We just deal direct with the customer. So you can order online at the cadence website. You can buy the rods direct off a cadence brand ambassador. Or if we're holding open day at a fishery near you, you can also buy them then. For general inquiries, you can contact us on the Facebook page of Cadence Fly Fishing, where we have a messenger. You can comment on this YouTube video, or you can contact me directly at Stuart Ingledew Fly Fishing on Facebook. That explains all the things that I do, and I'll, I'll be happy to meet you somewhere in the Northeast if you would like to try a rod out. Well, we've just come here to, uh, this is probably the most popular spot on the whole of the reservoir. Uh, Chappie's filming from the disabled platform. Uh, and between the disabled platform and the dam wall is a bit of a hot spot. This is also the place that you would come to sign in. So the hut is just over there with the portaloo. You also need to sign out as well when you're finished. But yeah, this is always the spot that's got the most people in, but it's it's not really that busy a place here, to be honest. I've no idea why. It couldn't really be much nicer, could it? There's actually just a fish come up, just out of range, but the way to be here seems to be fish the inside line before you wade out, but I think there's a few people wade out here just to get that extra couple of yards where the fish might be, because where you've got all of this flat flat gravel here, obviously the dam wall is going to go deeper, but this is shallower, and at some point it meets the deeper water, which I think is why it's one of the reasons it's a hot spot. But just to clear things up, I might have mentioned it earlier on, but the dam wall itself so that goes from there all the way up to the house at the other way, and Huri Reservoir House. Um, you can't actually fish from the dam wall. It's not a very big one. There's not much space to get on, but if you were to fish on there, there's quite often walkers come behind you, so they'll peer over without knowing anything about fly fishing. Um, so there's no fishing on the dam wall. That damn wall itself was, um, it was put under construction in 1891. 
So Huey was the first of the three reservoirs in this series to be built. We had Huey and then Blackton around the same time, same decade, and then Ballerhead at the top, I think it was 1960. Um, I know they're not a direct feeder, but this is basically one of the headwaters of the River Tee. Um, so just over where that tower is, just beyond it, it's where the River Balder flows out and that ultimately joins the River Tees. So you've got two pretty big UK rivers fed by the reservoirs in this area. Grassholm and Selsat feeding the Loon. Hurey, Balderhead and Blackton feeding the Tees. So while we're here, this bit here is the North Shore, obviously. Over there, the mirror image spot would be Corporal Hill. I don't think we're going to have time to fish that today, but that's another good spot in the different wind directions. It can be a helpful place to pit fish. And then just over there, we've got the schoon bank, where that farmhouse is with the single window in the wall. That can be okay. It's probably not fished that much, but just along from there is a bay with a point. There's a point. And there's a little deep spot that goes in there. I've had some really good days there. I don't know what the name of that place is though, but it can be good. But what I'm going to do now is just going to fish up the North Shore. I'm going to fish every 100 yards, every 150 yards and have five or six casts. But while we've got this line up of rocks here, um, I used to bait fish here as a kid back in the late 80s. And it used to be a fly fishery and a worm only fishery. And I can always remember along this whole stone bank, there was these wind breaks that the anglers had built so that it was that windy a place. They would have all these stone walls and they just became a permanent fixture along here. And also this is where I would come to fish with my dad when I was sort of like 14 or 15, maybe even younger. And we'd just sit on the deck chairs and fish all day and not really catch much. But I remember it was one of the um, the first places I actually learned that you can actually do something about fishing. And it was all down to him, really. He's not even a fisherman. Um, but he was sat watching us, catching no fish. And he told us that the worms were too big. They were far too big for the fish that were in here. And I put half a worm on or a really small worm. And I remember I got a fish straight away. And then we got another three in the next three casts. Um, so it was the first lesson I'd ever had where an angler can change something and it can have an immediate effect on the fish. So thanks very much for that, Dad. Right, here we are now. We're going to have a look at some of the flies that we've used to date, Huri, and some of the flies I'd recommend if you're going to be coming back in the future. Not everything's worked today, but over the course of time, I've put like a little list of patterns together that have done me well. It's not the be-all and end-all. There's a lot of other people will tell you that some flies will work better here and they'll catch fish on them. So this is just my selection. I would always have uh, a sink and line lures. I would always have the black cat's whisker with the, uh, the lure flash for its body. One that works well here is a pink cat's whisker. So this here. So that there is just like a cat's whisker, but it's pink. Pink wing and tail instead of white. These two here are the, are the main indicator flies that we've used. And today these have been good because I don't think the fish have been in a mood to chase so much. Once again, it's just gone from, I think, 16 degrees up to 26 maybe now today. It might have been a little bit lower earlier on, but... I think we're up to 26 degrees today and the fish are just so subdued. But the, these have been the, the ones working today. I started off on a, on a black electric ecstasy fly. And I think we had one fish on that early on. Uh, and then I got one fish on the peach. But it was kind of going in peaks and troughs as we went through the day. But once again, I'm afraid to tell you, it's this blue cheese fella that came good. Peach Marabou and a Peach Light Bright, that's always done me pretty well here as well. And this one here, I'm, I'm going to call it a cormorant. It's probably a bit big for the, the standard style of cormorant or the competition cormorant, but it's, uh, it's a pattern that does me well. 
And I think I, I really like the little luminous orange head on this one and the jungle cock cheeks. I've made the jungle cock cheeks just a little bit bigger than standard maybe, because there is quite a lot of roach and roach fry in here. And it, it, may, it maybe just represents one of them a little bit. Roach have also got red fins stroke orange fins. So that, that little orange head helps. What's underneath here, if I can lift that up there, is there's also orange thread, luminous orange thread underneath. And it's just, it's worth explaining here that when you use pearly thread, the pearly thread will show the color that's underneath. So if I put black under there, that pearly thread body would look a lot darker than it is while still maintaining the degree of glisten. So this, this here, is orange thread underneath with pearly thread wrapped over the top. And just to secure that down, I've put some silver or copper wire on the top and just a little bit of crystal flash in the end to give it some sparkle. But yeah, that's one of my favorites on here. I, it doesn't really have a name, but yeah, the jungle cock cheeks and the orange head, I really think sets it off lovely. So moving over to these ones here, we've obviously got just normal blobs and these in these colors i especially like the claret one on huri i don't know i've just i just have this confidence in black or claret in peaty water i have it on rivers at home uh, and on waters like this which i've been brought up on really over the 30 or 40 years these uh the, the claret blob is the one that i've got the most faith in but the orange and especially the fluoro, fluoro pink in the same way of the fluorescent pink cat's whisker, I have got confidence in that one as well. It's not been possible really today, but one tactic you can try here that really works quite nicely is to fish with a blob on the dropper and fish with a natural behind it. The blob will draw the fish into the area. They'll maybe take it or reject it, but once they've rejected it, they'll turn around and they'll find one of these little fellas three or four foot behind. So. Fishing a natural behind a blob, not with a blob on the point and the natural above. If you try that first with, with, a, with a colored pattern on the top and a natural behind, you'll probably not go too far wrong here. So any one of them, chop and change the colors, but I would, I would have the pink one and I would have a black and peacock spider. Black and peacock spider is the first fly that I ever tied. And I've still got massive faith in it now. I mean, it looks all nice and the hairs are sticking up there, but when it's wet and compacted down, it really does look natural and realistic, like a drone beetle or anything. It, peacock hurl is absolutely fantastic as a material, and that's why the likes of the dowel back and everything like that is, is so popular. Peacock hurl is, is the reason. If the flies that are coming off the water and you get a lot of dark black flies up here, if the flies that are coming off are really small, you might want to try one of these here, which is a black magic, which is effectively a very, very short dress black and peacock. So it's just a little thread body halfway down. And then there's a couple of racks of peacock curl in the top. But once again, once that collapses down when it's wet, it's a really effective fly. Maybe fish that later into the evening when there's smaller flies coming off. And this here is another classic here is the cruncher. So uh, this one's a darker cruncher, but you can have all manner of different colors. But once again, the jungle cock cheeks. And then we have a black pheasant tail. I've, I feel more confident here with a black pheasant tail than I do with a brown pheasant tail, but I wouldn't be that bothered if it was a brown or a curved pheasant tail like the, tr the traditional type. But yeah, that, that can be good, especially if there's buzzers knocking about. Onto the dry flies now. And uh, the one that we've caught on today, the one that we've got the little brownies on and that rainbow, and then we lost a couple of rainbows as well, is this one here, which is, I think I might have said it was a size 18. That's a size 20, that one there. Uh, and that's the actual fly that we got it on. So that's just a uh, black snowshoe rabbit with uh, arrow wing either side of it. I think there's a, a couple of strands of arrow wing either side. If that's sitting up too high, I'll just take the scissors to that just to trim it down. But that was fishing lovely today. This is a bigger version of the Shipman's. It's slightly more, I think it's the more original dressing, which is more like a, a ready, fiery brown kind of body. And then 
a white aero wing on either side scuffed up with uh, velcro or or another tool that would do the job i think most shipmen's buzzers the official line would be that they would have a rib but i, I tend to avoid putting the ribs because more often than not the first fish that catches them will pick the rib off and you'll you'll have that hanging off probably for your your day-to-day -day dry fly fishing this would be the one that I would go with here yeah, more than any other. This is a, a red, red, fiery brown hopper or a black one. Once again, we're in dark, dark kind of territory here. But I, I would probably fish this size on the enemy lane. But just for the purposes of the camera, this one here is a little bit easier to see. It's just a, um, it's just a, a red dubbin, and then there's six five six knotted pheasant legs tied in and then just a, a red game cock hackle with two or three turns i don't go too crazy with the number of turns i'd rather pick more dubbin out and have less turns of hackle just for the flirtability of the fly but if there's one thing that i would always recommend with a hopper for my own personal use as well and this is what i do myself is that when you buy a fly from a shop or from a fly tire you're going to have the hackles underneath there. And I, I think that affects the presentation. So what I do with all dry flies is I'll pull the legs out the way and I'll pull the hackle up. And it seems a bit nasty to do this, but I'll just clip them off. And what that does is that when that fly now casts out, there's not hackles that are keeping it standing up like a piece of bushweed on the surface. That fly now wants to sit like a fly on the top. So I think that's a really good tip. If you do get dry flies, maybe maybe uh, trim the hackles underneath. But hopefully that's a good run through of all the flies we've used. So just a quick minute on the lines that we've been using today. Most of the time, if I'm fishing with small lures uh, or droppers, I'll use the pure, the edge pure fluorocarbon. Um, this one in particular today. For the dry flies, I will use possibly the fluorocarbon down to three, three and a half pound breaking strain. Uh, but latterly, I've been having a little bit of a uh, mess around with the edge tackle floating and sinking mono. It's in a similar light to what I was saying before about the um, indicator setup and the dry fly setup. You want to have the fly line and the early part of the leader. In my opinion, you want to have those floating. So I spent a long time greasing stuff up. So when I found that Edge did this floating mono, I thought, oh, that's perfect. So we, we can use it as a, we can do it as a tapered leader of sorts. So what I tend to have with most dry fly setups at the minute, and it's really working well, the presentation of mono, there's something different about it. It's not as stiff. Um, and it has fooled a couple of fish that were just refusing time after time after time on, on fluorocarbon, even though this stuff was slightly thicker. So anyway, this what, what I would do here is maybe, depending on the leader length that you're going to have, but I would maybe have two-thirds length of floating mono, eight pound. And then you can either go straight into the four pound sinking mono, which is 0.18 mil. So that tapers down from 0.22. If you really want to be exact, you can go from eight pound to six pound floating mono and then down to four pound and that'll work lovely. One of the other things I do is instead of carrying another spool of 6.6 .6 pound to tie indicator rigs, I just tie these up by myself. So I have seven or eight of these in my bag before I go fishing. So we've got the fly already mounted. We've got all the fluorocarbon wrapped around. I've got the, the depth that's marked. It's always 6.6 .6 for the indicator setups. So all I have to do there is literally tie that to the end of the fly line, pull that out of the tippet ring, and we're good to go in a few seconds. And that saves a lot of messing on on the bank. So I'll always have seven or eight of these handy in the bag. Oh, we're here now, right at the west end of the reservoir. This is called the Boils. And it's just Blackton Reservoir. It's just up over the dam wall there. We've just come here, and it's the first time we've been able to get at it today. But 
it's quite a popular spot and the reason is the big boil out in the middle there and that's where you get the water from one of the reservoirs above comes from underneath and then is pumped upwards into the reservoir which puts loads of oxygen and cooler water in so it's pretty obvious why this is such a, a good spot in such warm weather and another string to Huey's bow and why it's good in summer conditions I think there's another boil as well that's further over and there may be alternate because I seem to remember fishing a boil over there a couple of times but this is the one that's been on recently. Just as we come down here there is there is a couple of fish coming up right in this quiet corner in the still water in the corner in the scummy area. I think there may be roach. It was difficult to tell from afar but We'll just try the little shipments over the top of them to start with. Well, it's been no good for me here today at the boils, but it's definitely a place that you should come, especially in the summer at Huey. That's a good fish, wow. That's a much better one. This is uh, four or five pound, I think. Wow. Let's get this one in. That's a lovely fish. Ordinarily, I wouldn't be too bothered about getting the line on the reel. The problem we've got here is there's just reeds and stuff all over the place. And if it makes a run and gets caught in that, it's curtains. So get it on the reel in this instance. Oh wow, that's a lovely fish. This is a 101. That's easily five. Well, we've come back to this spot. It's the middle of the day, about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and we just thought we'd dip back in near that bush where we had a fish earlier on, and we've got this fish here to sign off with. It's the best fish of the day. It's five or six pound, and it's absolutely perfect Huey fish in absolutely smashing condition. Let's put them back. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And by all means, put a comment and I'll try to answer where possible.